Hello class, this is Mrs. Silvestro and we are reading The Wild Robot. We are continuing with chapters 52, 53, 54, and 55. Chapter 52, The Flock. Bright Bill slowly waddled into the nest. He had a confused look on his face. Mama, the other goslings said that we have to leave the island soon and we won't return for months and months. Is that true? That is true said Roz. You know that geese migrate south for winter. Will you migrate with us, said Brightbill. I cannot fly or swim, so I will spend the winter here on the island. Can I stay with you? I do not think that is a good idea. I think you should migrate with the flock. How long will the migration take, said Brightbill. Where will we fly? When will we come home? I do not know, said Roz. Let us go ask the others. And so the robot and the gosling walked around the pond to where Loudwing and her friends were chatting. Hello, everyone, said Roz. Brightbill has some questions about the flock's upcoming winter migration. And we'd be happy to answer them, said Loudwing. What would you like to know, little one? How long will the migration take, said Brightbill? Where will we fly? When will we come home? It'll take us a couple of weeks to fly south, said Loudwing, depending on the weather. We'll join other flocks at a beautiful lake in the middle of a great sprawling field, said another goose. We'll come back to the island after four or five months, said someone else, depending on the weather. As they walked back to the nest, Brightbill said to his mother, Lately, I've been feeling the strong urge to fly, not just around the pond or the island, but to go on a long flight, a journey. Those are your instincts, said the robot. All animals have instincts. They help you survive. Do you have instincts? said the gosling. I do have instincts. They help me survive also. My instincts are definitely telling me to fly south for the winter, said Brightbill. I just wish that you could join us. I'm going to worry about you while I'm away. Do not worry. I will be fine, said Roz. How bad could winter be? Chapter 53, The Migration. It was the night before the migration and Brightbill was sleeping fitfully. Roz watched him toss and turn until he finally crawled up into her arms and she rocked him to sleep, just like the old days. Early the next morning, Brightbill waddled outside and looked at the pond. The water was perfectly still. A few lazy clouds drifted above. Geese were already gathered by the beach. And then tiny claws scampered down from the treetops. So today's the day, huh? said Chit Chat, perched on a branch. You're going to see so many new things and meet so many new animals, and if there are any squirrels at your at wintering grounds, please tell them that Chit Chat says hello. Today is the day, said Bright Bill. The flock will be leaving soon. Are you excited or nervous or scared? I am all of those things. The squirrel whispered, well, don't worry about your mother. I'll look after her so you know she'll be perfectly fine. Bright Bill smiled. I'm afraid it is time to go, said Roz as she stepped out of the nest. Okay, Mama, said the gosling. See you in the spring, Chit Chat. Have a nice migration, Bright Bill. The squirrel scampered back into the treetops. Come home with lots of exciting stories, but not too exciting because I don't want anything scary to happen to you. Goodbye. The geese were honking with excitement and hustling around as they made their final preparations. Several of the fathers huddled together discussing the flight plans while mothers took a head count. There you are, Brightbill, Loudwing honked from the middle of the crowd. We're just about to begin. May I have your attention, please, said the biggest goose. As most of you know, my name is Longneck and I'll be leading this year's migration. I'm asking everyone to please join your families for takeoff. Once we're all airborne, each family will take its position in our V formation and we'll start the first leg of our journey. Are there any questions? I have a question, came a booming voice. My son will not have any family with him. Where does he fit into the formation? Everyone turned to Long Neck. He can fly with me, said the big goose. I hear Brightbill is a very clever flyer. I could use his help at the point. A moment later, the geese began flapping and honking and making their way into the air. A cloud of feathers floated down around the robot and her son. You are not a gosling anymore, said Roz. I am proud of the fine young goose you've become. Blight, Bright Bill fluttered up to his mother's shoulders. Thanks, Mama. The young goose wiped his eyes. 
Is this where we say goodbye? This is where we say goodbye for now. Spring will be soon be here and we will be together again. I'm going to miss you, said Brightbill as he nuzzled his mother. I'm going to miss you too, said Roz as she nuzzled her son. The goose took a deep breath. Then he shook his tail feathers, flapped his wings and joined the flock. At first the geese flew in a disorganized jumble, but each goose slowly drifted into position until the flock formed a wobbly V. At the head was Longneck and behind his left wing was Brightbill. They circled in the sky until the V pointed south and then the geese began their long migration. Roz climbed down to the top of Roz climbed to the top of a tree and watched as the flock slowly faded into the horizon. Chapter 54, The Winter. The island was quiet. The migratory birds had all left and the hibernators were asleep and everyone else had begun their simple winter routines. Everyone but Roz. Now that she was alone, our robot, robot didn't know what to do with herself. She stood in her gray garden and watched a sheet of ice slowly form on the pond. Sometimes she could hear her good friends, the beavers, going about their business beneath the ice, and she wondered when she would see them again. Roz stood there until snowflakes started drifting down from the sky. The flakes swirled in the breeze and slowly piled up on the ground and on the trees and on the robot. So she crouched into the nest. She slid the stone door behind her and sat in darkness. Hours and days and weeks went by without the robot moving. She had no need to move. She felt, felt perfectly safe in the nest. And so, in her own way, the robot hibernated. Roz's body relaxed. Her quiet whirring slowly stopped. Her eyes faded to black. She probably could have spent centuries like that, hibernating in total darkness. But the robot's hibernation was suddenly interrupted when a shaft of sunlight fell upon her face and carried energy back to her empty battery. Roz's body tensed. Her quiet whirring slowly started. Her eyes began to glow. Hello, I am Rosam Unit 7134, but you may call me Roz, the robot said automatically. When her systems were up and running again, Roz noticed she was surrounded by broken branches and piles of snow. The roof of the nest had caved in, and the lodge was now flooded with sunlight. Roz felt more energized with each passing minute, but she also felt cold. Her joints felt stiff and brittle, and her thinking was slow. So she got up, cleared a spot on the floor, and made a fire. The snow inside the nest began to melt and the robot sensors began to thaw. And when she was ready, she climbed out through the hole in the roof and into the bright foreign landscape. The world Roz had known was now covered in a thick layer of snow. Tree limbs bent to the ground under heavy sleeves. The dark pond was now pure white. The only sounds were Roz's own crunching footsteps. Faint wisps of steam curled up from the robot's body as she trudged through the forest. Roz plunged a hand to the lump of snow and pulled up a long stick. She snapped it in half and flung both pieces back to the nest. She took a few more steps and picked up a fallen tree. She hacked it into smaller pieces and flung them back as well. Then she reached down to another snowy shape. But what she pulled up was not a piece of wood. It was a dart the weasel. He was frozen solid. Rose stared at his stiff body for a moment, then decided it was best to leave the poor thing where he was. As the robot continued to gather wood, she found more victims of the cold. A frozen mouse, a frozen bird, a frozen deer. Had all the animals frozen to death? No, not all. There were a few fresh tracks in the snow. As we know, the wilderness is filled with beauty, but it's also filled with ugliness. And that winter was ugly. A devastating cold front had swept down from the north and brought dangerous temperatures and huge amounts of snow. The animals had prepared for winter, but nothing could have prepared the weaker ones for those long nights when the temperatures plummeted and the wind whipped over the island. Roz returned to the nest where the fire had melted the interior snow to a muddy soup. She took a minute to warm her body by the flames and then she began with repairs. She patched up the hole in the dome with a latticework of branches before adding a layer of mud and leaves, and soon the repairs were complete. But another snowfall might cave in the nest all over again. So Roz decided to keep a fire going day and night to prevent snow from building up on the roof. The robot 
bought, brought in load after load of firewood, and each time she went outside, she was reminded of the frozen weasel and mouse and bird and deer. How many other frozen animals were hidden beneath the snow? Before going in for the night, she called to whoever was listening. Islands of Animals of the island, you do not have to freeze. Join me in my lodge where it is safe and warm. Chapter 55, The Lodgers. Firelight spilled out from the nest and in the cold, butter, blustery night. Ra sat inside and listened to the wind and to the soft pops and crackles of burning wood. And then the robot's keen hearing picked up another sound. Tiny footsteps crunching through the snow. Roz, I'm freezing. Can I join you by the fire, please? Said a weak voice. Into the light crawled Chit Chat. The squirrel was shivering and clumps of ice stuck to her fur. When she finally felt the heat of the fire, she collapsed. Roz picked her up off the floor, gently placing her on a warm stone and let her sleep. An hour later, there were more footsteps and a family of hares shuffled into the nest. They huddled together in a corner without saying a word. Pinktail the possum was next to arrive. Good evening, she mumbled, trying to act cheerful. It certainly has been ch chilly. Swoober the owl hobbled in, followed by some chickadees and a magpie. Fink knew a good thing when he saw it, and the fox lay down right by the fire. Then came Dig Down and grabbed the groundhog. The fuzzy bandits carried in an old turtle named Crag, who was the worst shape of all. Creatures who should have been hibernating deep underground had been roused by the vicious weather. Only the healthiest animals with the warmest homes were safe. More and more weary animals appeared, and slowly the lodge filled up. This was the first time many of the lodgers had seen fire, and they gazed at it with a mixture of fear and hope. They could feel the fire's destructive power, but they also could feel its healing powers as it warmed their bones. The lodgers seemed to push forward, eager to move more, feel more warmth, but then pull back, afraid of feeling too much. It was important that the lodgers understood fire, so Ra showed them how to build one. She showed the smaller animals how to arrange the kindling, and she showed the bigger animals how to arrange the logs. Bumpkin, Lumpkin, and Pump Rumpkin struck the firestones together, and everyone cheered when they finally managed to spark. As Roz looked around, she saw moles curling up beside an owl. A mouse snuggled between two weasels. Hares nestled against a badger. Never before had the robot seen prey and predators so close and peaceful. But how long could this possibly last? I propose a truce, said Roz. Like the dawn truce, everyone must agree not to hunt or harm one another while in my lodge. Very well, said Swooper, after consulting his carnivorous friends. We hunters will control ourselves. Then it is settled, said Roz. My home is a safe place for all. One by one, the lodgers each fell into a deep sleep. Even the nocturnal creatures, usually wide awake at that hour, gave in to the coziness of the nest. The robot stood out of the way and quickly, quietly tended to the fire as her guests slept through the night. Only when daylight was streaming in through the door did the lodgers finally begin to stir. You are all welcome to stay here as long as you like, said the robot as the animals rubbed sleep from their eyes. My home is your home. Thanks a lot, Roz. Fink carefully stepped over a hare and a woodpecker on his way to the door. I don't think I would have survived another night on my own. It's just too bad we can't cram a few more creatures in here. And the fox slipped outside. The robot looked down at the fur and the feathers that now carpeted the floor. The nest had been completely full that night. If any more animals showed up, they'd be left out in the cold. But Roz was not about to let that happen. Thanks for reading with me today, and we'll continue tomorrow.